sorry, part two. Uh, there was an alarm that went off on my phone. I wonder what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but I've also, I've lost my train of thought and that's never a good thing. Oh, I also see this being done whole class. What happens whole class? It's the Matthew effect. Those who have get more, those who don't have get less. So the kids who know it, they're doing their things and they're saying it all out. And the ones who don't know it, they're like mumbling and then repeating after the kids who know it. So they're not getting the error correction and redirection and all that they need. Uh, we ask, besides kindergarten, for our phonemic awareness to be done in small group. So you can be diagnostic, prescriptive, and get the error correction for what is needed. So, for whatever that's worth. I have a student in seventh grade that after a year of solid OG still struggles with MP confusion and is reading with 80% accuracy at second grade. It can be hard for her to pronounce many multisyllabic words. Yes, can definitely work for her. Absolutely, Liz. That, this is like our kids. That the thousands and thousands that come to our reading center, tens of thousands in classrooms that, that have this, uh, present like this, absolutely. Um, very much so. And it and it shifts. And, and, you know, a lot of people on the chat were talking about that last night. A lot of people whose kids had had OG and then they switched to, to you know, speech first approach. So that is awesome. Do you include morphology? Yes. Just like everything else that we do, we include it in the context of what we're teaching. We don't say, oh, here's a morphology lesson on on or do or whatever, um, you know, plurals or we don't have that in isolation. When we're teaching un, uh, unuseful or whatever, that word, let's say they're going to be spelling that, reading that. We'll talk about un means not and full means full of. So this is not full of use, you know, and then how does that apply? And typically, especially after the beginning phases of Ebley, um, these are words that are pulled from a story where they're learning the vocabulary, they're learning how to read them, or they're learning how to spell them. So then when they read, they're going to be more fluent and comprehend more. So we in embed that. And we may say, okay, you guys, your homework for tonight, because if you're going to do homework, make it useful, right? Find three words that um, have, you know, the prefix un or the suffix full or whatever, so that they can discover, which is a great way to learn, and... Um, you know, and expand on, on that information. But we don't need to do a lot of drill of the information when we have a process that goes along with how their brain learns best. What are the biggest differences between my Ebley and phonographics? The costs are vastly different and I'm willing to pay for more, but I would love a comparison, yeah. That's a really great question. Um, oh goodness, phonographics is very focused on learn how to decode and do it accurately with our, they had, and I don't know if they still have it because I, I haven't done it in years, but they had a, a tackle box with 36 different drawers and stacks of cards that you cut up to put into the different drawers for the different stuff. And then they have the code where it's bolded if it's a two letter spelling like OA and boat or a three letter spelling like IGH and high and that type of thing. And you kind of go through that. Not, and they do have some stories, but not a lot. They do have some stories. Um, and so it's not applied to the text as much, you know, beyond the stories that they use. So my goal is always to teach classroom teachers, first and foremost, so we have that level of prevention. Um, and what I was doing, and classroom teachers like, we're not doing this. And how is this applying to all of this, you know, whatever I'm reading, whether it's a basal series or level, whatever they may be having in their classroom. Um, so they're just like, mm -mm, not, not going to do it. This doesn't work for me. So that was, that's one of the ways. We don't bold text except for the very, very beginning of kindergarten, just to sh you know, show off for those kids. We also have a much streamlined, much, much streamlined, and second grade and up, 80% of our uh, focus is on multi-syllable words, and we have a very streamlined practice of multi-syllable words. We don't have all the little cards that they have for the building. We don't do any building, actually, past the very first few weeks of kindergarten. We don't, it, where they pull the little cards and do all of that. We don't do that at all. We do it all with placeholders, which are uh, our lines. Um, so that's a difference too. But the multi-syllable, we do a lot of it with application to reading and authentic text. We'll, we have things included in our training that are like the read works articles that go along with each grade level and the common core and all of that. Um, and we also, also what's important to me is to include handwriting and we, we embed that into our instruction and also to include spelling and writing in application. So the spelling instruction obviously is there and how we apply it to writing and also more on vocabulary expansion and re, you know moving into real books and how do we apply it? Okay, I've got my science textbook here. How am I gonna do a, a lesson using this with that? We actually teach them exactly how to do that. That's some of the ways. We, we segment every word to the smallest unit of sound with very, very few exceptions. They keep um, the endings like 
Sean and Shust and those kinds of things all together as one unit. So we're on this horse and then we have to jump to that horse, you know, to do that. So um, what other things are there? Um, we split our words like so. When I say to the smallest unit of sound, a word like large would be u, a, r, j. So four sounds. Instead of keeping that R together, uh, we don't separate like in the word note. We don't have O and then E as the spelling. It's N, O, and the T is that consonant E because that's a really strong pattern throughout English and not just with that one letter spelling before. Also keeps us going left to right. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things, but um, that is some of them. Um, in there, different activities that go really well with classroom instruction. And we, those classroom instruction ones, we, when we were in the intervention, we don't do those as much because you're usually in intervention with kids a set amount of time for so much time and we want to get them really more focused. And if they're doing Ebley in their classroom too, that's a huge, beautiful thing, but they don't have to be. So that's some of the ways. If, if you have specific questions about that, Jen, please feel free to email and we would um, we'd help you out with that. But that's from the top of my head, some of the things. We work with refugees. I know that speech to print is best. Any resources using this with beginner ESL? No difference, except for there, there is one difference. What I would recommend is that you have something. I love the Richard Scarry book of, I forget what it's called, but there's all, Busy Town, maybe, might not be Busy Town. Oh, I'm gonna have to look at that, that up. Let me um, write that down so I don't care. I uh, forget, I'll, I'll include it in the links. So what it has is like a playground and it'll be a swing and a slide and there's a picture of it. So having a picture, that's what I would need if I'm learning a new language, which I'd love to do one day. But yeah, okay, what are we talking about here? You're telling me the word, I don't really know what that means. So starting with things that are nouns that they can relate to and then saying it, have them repeat the word. Now let's say the sounds, look away from, you know, you aren't looking at the word on the page, do the whole process with putting the sounds down and then a sentence. I went down the slide and, and I'll even do, I went down the slide. So those ELL kids really, regardless of what language that they have, you have to, you know, the, the progression is we listen so long before we speak, we speak so long before we read, we read so long before we write. Well, now these kids haven't been listening or speaking English and we're getting them to the reading stage. So we have to, those stages that typically when you're naturally learning it in your own language, take like five years to go through, we're doing them all simultaneously. And you can, it just takes, you know, a little more finesse. So using a book where they can relate, and that's why I like instead of like just a picture book of words uh, that have a picture with the word, you know, but it's in the context. Here's what's in the kitchen and here's what's in the playground and here's in the schoolroom. And it's stuff that, that's relatable to them. Um, so that's what I would recommend definitely for that. We're at 35 guys, we're almost there. 12 hours. So can this be completed in two weeks of daily instruction? Susan, it can. When we have now, since COVID, we didn't use to teach online too much. We do a lot now. Um, and and um, so we can have people from all over the world, which is fun. But we used to always do in person. And when people would come from a different state, they would typically come and oftentimes do two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon and stay for three or four days or, you know, uh, whatever the, the timing and go back. Now, I, it's not the most perfect thing for older students. It's not that big of a deal, really. But it's a lot of a, you know, it's a lot of information, a lot of processing. You don't have time to process in between that type of thing. But you certainly can do it um, like that for sure. How do you explain that you write? Now, these next ones I'm really not going to answer because these are like, you know what? I can't do it every training on a question and answer type of thing. But if I have something that I could say quick about it. How do you explain that you write E for the uh sound and the in a way that doesn't make them think they always write E for the uh sound? Again, it's part of the whole process of how we teach them in a way that is logical and works with an analytical brain and it's really quite great with the same process too. So we do we do have a way that we do that. We teach the most common sounds first, like eh is gonna be taught with our kindergartners. The older ones, no, but with our kindergartners, that's going to be taught in a progression from one letter spellings with the most common sound and then evolve from there. But we teach all those one letter spellings first. Could you show how you would teach the word was or what? Just the word and say the sounds. Yep. Woo, uh, z is was. All right. Space holder says right. Uh, the space holder show the word says right. What? Woo, uh, t. Placeholders says right. We love those words because kids spell them out wrong all the time, right? You can turn that spelling around so quick, it's really, really fun. So that's how we do that, those two words, Tanya. How would you teach the different spelling sounds for ow, O-W and O-U, I'm sorry. So the, um, I'm sure that's ow, while still using the curriculum provided by your district. 
every district that we use has a different curriculum, it seems. Sometimes there's different materials and different processes and different practices and different delivery ways within the same grade level in the same school, okay? So it doesn't matter what's being used. If it's reading, writing, and spelling, you teach this explicit instruction in the same way, and then you apply it to the reading, writing, and spelling. So it's this, what happens in a lot of districts is that a lot of the stuff that teachers are asked to do, like it always blows my mind, and I have one over here, uh, uh, you know, whatever, I don't know which one it is. It's one of the Basil series where here's a unit and here's 40 activities. Now, a teacher is not going to do 40 activities in a unit. Which ones do you choose, I ask teachers. And they're like, we get to choose which ones we choose. And really, n most of them are busy work. Not very few, if any, are explicit instruction or practice or anything that are on what the kids need to be doing. It's a lot of stuff. And what we say is stuff does not teach the kids how to read or reinforce it, really. Teachers do, right? So we need to teach that stuff, teach the information in the process and then apply it and then have them move more and more toward toward independence so um you do these sorts and then you apply it in, in what they're going to do so it doesn't matter what it is in the curriculum or what you're using or any of that if it's if it includes reading writing and spelling uh, a process that teaches explicitly based on our speech sounds first what we already have and know naturally and applying it to the print will work with anything like that do you explain how you map a word that doesn't fit the sounds? A tricky word. Yeah. Again, in our that's our whole process. What whether it's you know, and who gets to decide what's a tricky word, which is interesting to me. Um, we don't use that language. We don't use this is hard or this is difficult or this is irregular. We may say this is a spelling you're not familiar with, with that S spelling, and we demark that to point it out to them so that they're like, oh, that's something unusual that's new to me. Ding ding, thank you, brain. And then um and then we just move on. So simple, streamlined, effective, efficient, move us. We, want, we don't want to keep building the car, right? We want to drive the car. We don't want to keep building the house. We want to live in the house. We don't want to keep teaching you how to read. We want, to, we want you to read. We want you to apply really quickly what you're doing. And, and again, as I said last night, a lot of what happens and what slows everything down is the mindset that more is better. We think, well, if we're doing this, and then we do this, this, and this, then that's better. But a lot of times you're doing this, and this contradicts this, and this, you know, um, causes confusion with this. And so, so you, again, you just keep muddying the water, and the, and the kids are confused, and you're confused, and like, when are we supposed to use what? More is not better. Better is better, okay? So um, Steve Dykstra had said this one thing, you know, we don't need more cookie cutters. We need a really good cookie cutter. And then we, we have what we need to do to differentiate for whether that needs to be more or less of this, you know, cookie cutter thing. So it's, and, and I'm not saying that this is a cookie cutter because never our kids in teaching them cookie cutter thing, but there is a process that's very, very efficient, very, very effective of teaching reading. If you go from what we already know, when we come to learn to read, which is the sounds coming out of our mouth, the words coming out of our mouth. We help them get quickly to the sounds. Then we show them, here's a symbol. The symbol could have been, I don't know, a, a shape or a dog or a whatever, a different kind of dog. The symbol to represent the sounds. That's, you know, back in the day, all those Sumerians and all those people ask after them realize like, oh, this picture thing isn't working good because everybody gets a different thought. Just like our kids looking at the picture, they all get a different something different out of it. Same thousands of years ago. So now let's do part of the word. Well, this isn't working so well either. So let's not do that. Let's move to the sound, which is where we got to. But it's, you know, it's not like black and white, as I said, all those 50,000 shades of gray. So all of our questions are done. Hopefully you got your answers in your... Um, in your email, we are going to do something about the, the scope and sequence and kind of give anybody who has uh, been had this watch the webinar, not if they haven't watched the webinar, but if you watch the webinar and the question and answer, well, you don't have to have watched this, but anyway, you I'm going to do this thing um, so that you can go through and see what our scope and sequence is so I can explain it to you a little bit without just plopping it to you or sending it to you, which makes me very uncomfortable and, and giving you some context. All right. So hopefully I'll see you there. And if you've listened to this whole big long thing, thank you for that. And um, be sure you get on that speech to print exploration page and let's keep learning together. All right. Thanks.